I was asked to talk a bit about some of the uh, international developments, uh, which in a way is a bit of a contextual thing, so it's a bit hard to do on the last day. So I want to take that uh, to, to do a bit of that, but to talk a bit about, I think, some of the things that are emerging from this conference and the, and the context here in Australia. So I'll try and link those two. Um, but I will start off with Planet Under Pressure. This was the, this was the wordle from all the um, social media questions that were sent into the plenary session. There were 700 or so of them uh, at, at uh, Planet Under Pressure. Um, and so I want to, I want this to change, yep. Um, I, I want to talk just briefly about uh, uh, some of the things that came out of that conference and related a little bit to Rio uh, last week and, and perhaps a tiny bit to the uh, Adaptation Futures Conference that was in Arizona a month ago. Um, Planet Under Pressure, I mean, there was 3,000 people there in London and another 3,500 or so online for the, for the plenary session. Um, we had uh, a Twitter reach, whatever that is, of two and a half million people. Um, there was uh, an, an enormous amount of media that came out of it. There was a lot of work before the conference to engage with the political processes leading up to Rio. Uh, and, and something like 400 or so original media stories that came out of the conference, which were syndicated into thousands in 15 languages and, and 50 countries. And I say all of that because uh, I want to touch on a bit uh, the degree to which I think our global science is, uh, is, is producing all sorts of amazing things, but at times is a bit uh, dislocated from policy, and that might be something that's happening here in Australia a little bit at the moment too. So the, uh, the conference, uh, amongst other things, produced a declaration, the first state of the planet declaration. It was, it was boldly termed. And I want to touch on the three areas of scientific endeavor that it highlighted that had evolved in the last, that had particularly, I think, come to the fore in the last decade or so, although all of them have their roots before that. Um, they're quite high level things, but I think they're still, uh, and of course there was lots of other more specific things, uh, but I think they're quite relevant to uh, what, we're, what we're thinking about here. The first one was this uh, whole idea of the Anthropocene, the idea that uh, humanity now is, has such a footprint on the world that we potentially are in a new geological um, epoch because of those impacts and some putative future geologists uh, will be able to detect uh, our, our footprint very clearly. Uh, this, was a <clears throat> this is just the opening or part of the opening of a, of a film which was produced about the Anthropocene, which was actually played in the opening ceremony for the leaders uh, at Rio last week, last Wednesday. Um, and, and uh, I mean, I love some of the statistics that sit behind this. This is just to illustrate one of them, uh, which is that we now, we now move more sediment in the world each year easily as humans um, than all the rivers uh, that, that there would have been flowing to the sea moving sediment prior to civilization. And just one little sort of trivial example of that is this developments in Dubai here, all these uh, Palm Island and, um, and the world and the sort of islands that are being constructed there, which I'm looking forward to being constructed in Lake Burley Griffin in, in Canberra, because I'm sure it would improve that. Uh, however, if they did actually construct this in Lake Burley Griffin, um, it would probably fill the entire thing in, because this involved moving three gigatons of sediment to create these things, which is about equivalent to 20% of the total uh, sediment moved by rivers prior to people damming them up. So just one project here is having that sort of impact uh, on the globe in terms of the amount of stuff we move. And of course, there's a host of other areas. Uh, we, we produce uh, well over half the um, active nitrogen, reactive nitrogen in the globe. We, we largely control the freshwater system. We have big impacts on the phosphorus cycle uh, and, and all sorts of other things. And of course, we're uh, make, making big changes to the, uh, to the chemistry of our atmosphere and, um, uh, and oceans. So, so um, this idea of the uh, Anthropocene, I think, is actually a pretty profound, I mean, it's, a, it's a one which has potential cultural, um, emotional, almost religious sort of overtones to it that we can no longer get away with imagining that someone's going to step in and fix up things if we, if we stuff up the world. Um, this really is uh, our own responsibility, and we can't sort of go west and, and find some new country. And uh, as it is, we know we are pushing towards or over uh, multiple boundaries in this. And the second area of um, commentary from, the, from Planet Under Pressure was, was just the extraordinary interconnected nature of our, of our global Earth system and, and the uh, human systems within that, but, uh, but the entire system. Uh, and the Im implications that that's got, these multiple boundaries, um, uh, but also, I think if you think back 20 years ago, it would be very hard to imagine the levels of resource flows, the information flows, financial flows, uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, Mark Howden referred yesterday to the, to the variability in some of the food system aspects. And those sorts of things are characteristics of highly interconnected systems. They give you some stability because you can uh, access resources from places where it's efficient to grow them. Uh, but if you start getting um, uh, 
uh, if you start getting pressures in parts of the system, they can very rapidly propagate through that system, and you can get all sorts of uh, uncertainties from it. So this is, a, this is a system which has changed dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years, and we have yet perhaps to fully catch up with how to do that. Uh, it means that we need to uh, deal with global changes beyond just the climatic ones. Uh, it also means that we need to integrate our science much more across the social and uh, biophysical domains. And I think the whole idea of social ecological systems, uh, which, I th which need to underpin a lot of our adaptation work, uh, have be has become much more to the fore in the past decade. Um, but also uh, the uh, planet under pressure in particular focused in on some of the improving understanding of governance work and particularly governance issues that relate to the particular sorts of natural resource and global environmental change issues that we face. And uh, I mean, part of that is understanding the failures and limitations of our current setup of uh, international institutions, UN and other things, uh, for dealing with these types of problems. Um, but also, I think uh, a profound area is the whole issue of, um, of the sort of multi-scalar nature uh, that, that we really need for solutions. And this is going to be a bit of a theme that I want to pick up through this talk but is really well illustrated by this uh, quote from Lynn Ostrom, who uh, you may know, well, she was the uh, chief scientific advisor for the Planet Under Pressure Conference, uh, and also, of course, the first uh, woman to, to win uh, a Nobel Prize for economics, uh, but, <clears throat> but who sadly died two weeks ago. And on the day she died, uh, I mean, an immense loss of an incredible intellect, but also a wonderfully lovely person uh, from the world. But on the day she died, this uh, was a commentary which was published um, by her, or uh, in her absence, but by her uh, in uh, Worldwide. And, and it makes this point really well, that we haven't had to deal with this level of interconnectedness in the past, so we don't really know quite what will work. But one thing that uh, a whole stack of research over the past couple of decades has shown, and a lot of it was Lynn's herself, uh, is that you actually need a, a variety, a, a sort of polycentric approach to this uh, at multiple scales, all the way from uh, very local up to international, and that's much more likely to work than putting all your uh, eggs in the basket of one great, wonderful treaty in Rio. So, um, <clears throat> so to go to Rio for a moment, uh, <clears throat> it, uh, how you view Rio depends a lot on whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty. Uh, now, there's an interesting thing that if you go looking for clip art of uh, a half full glass of margarita, uh, you can't actually find one, which, <laughs> <coughs> which when I reflect on it is actually the state of uh, glasses of margarita in my hand too, usually, but um, it's very rarely only half full. Um, but depending, so I had to fall back on a, a half empty glass of wine here, which you probably have seen quite a bit of last night. Um, and uh, if, you, if you have the more negative view on this, uh, or possibly more realistic view, I don't know, here's a quote from George Monbiot, the greatest failure of collective leadership since the First World War, uh, and other things, um, perhaps the silver lining, that adaptation is now the main game. Um, I mean, that is, uh, there's very widespread uh, commentary around the world, I think, that, um, that, the, that Rio really didn't get very, anywhere very exciting. Um, putting a more uh, sort of positive frame on it, uh, Dilma Rousseff, the uh, president of of uh, uh, Brazil, who might have had quite a few margaritas, or uh, um, what's the, what's the uh, Brazilian equivalent? I forget now, but anyway, uh, might have had quite a few before saying in the opening ceremony there that this was a wonderful global expression of democracy. I was talking to some Brazilians a couple of days ago, and apparently a few hours later she signed uh, four uh, economic development agreements with, uh, with China the same day, which were largely about ripping resources out of somewhere. But anyway, so there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance occasionally amongst some of our leaders. Um, but in fact, behind all of that, nonetheless, there were some, there were some good uh, little building blocks, um, some of which have been talked about more widely, others, others less so. Uh, but if I was to nominate two or three of them, which I think are really important, even if they could have moved f further and faster at Rio, it's the idea of developing the sustainable development goals, which might really bring together those uh, economic, uh, environmental, and social uh, aspects of, of, of the global system, uh, and a process for, at least a process for thinking about, debating about whether there should be a high-level sustainable development body within the UN, which could have a stronger uh, power in driving some of that along. There was a load of actually much more specific commitments around the side. I mean, really a load. I think there was something like 700 uh, of them uh, in a whole stack of areas, but uh, ones like the oceans, which are very important. But I think if there was one thing which really came out of that meeting, which uh, is both hopeful and, uh, and positive, um, and which resonates very greatly with uh, what Lynn uh, Ostrom was saying, is that there was a very strong set of movements in, in all sorts of uh, lower level processes uh, and engagement of 
particularly perhaps above all else, uh, cities across the world as a level of governance that can, just has to get on and do things um, and potentially could do so in a coordinated way uh, which delivers things at a global scale. Uh, but there are many other areas in, in NGOs, uh, civil society in, and, and also very much in, in business which Ian might touch on a bit more after this. So given all of that, um, let me just reflect a bit on some of the changes, shifting realities I've put here um, that, we, that we face and perhaps how the, some of the things we've been talking about here interact with that. I mean, at the global level, firstly, these risks obviously aren't going away, but equally, uh, we may as well give up the expectation that there's just going to be a magical solution in somewhere like Rio. In, in a peculiar sort of way, some of this actually gives us a lot more certainty, at least a lot more certainty than the Productivity Commission report would have you think. Uh, in terms of some minimum changes, really a very little doubt that we will be seeing two degrees C somewhere mid-century and, uh, and something greater than that beyond that. Um, and so, I mean, uh, in a perverse way, uh, there are some certainties emerging um, out of all of this in terms of minimum amount, amounts of change and consequently the importance for adaptation. Uh, in all of that, it means we also have more certainty that at least in terms of risk management, we need to think about the higher ends of things and, uh, and the transformative uh, end of change becomes something that we need to factor in properly uh, and as a, uh, a matter of responsibility, make sure it's being thought about. And all the issues that go with that in terms of longer lead times and so on that Mark Howden mentioned again yesterday um, are really important there. When you come down to the national level, I mean, I, I think there is a bit of a sense that uh, state governments and potentially the national government, uh, even just once having got the carbon price in place, is going to feel like it's sort of done climate change for the time being uh, and it'll turn its, uh, turn its mind to other things. Um, and so there is a bit of a sense that there might be a bit of a loss, reduction in interest here nationally uh, in climate change, nationally and at state levels. Um, and, and so I think I see, and, I, and I've heard a fair bit of it at this meeting, a, a sort of reframing uh, a bit more around current decisions around climate risk, current, and then, and then sneaking in the aspects that that's going to change into the future. Uh, and certainly fitting all of this discourse in, into a set of wider drivers, which I think is a good thing anyway. Um, so I, I think that is a path that we probably end up going down a bit um, for, the next, for the next couple of years. Um, but if so, then of course it's really important, I think as Chris was really saying on the first day, that we watch out for uh, these sort of creeping thresholds that sneak up on us, the complacency that they, that uh, the apparent safety of having a very large um, uh, uh, wall in front of the ocean might give you, uh, and the risks of malad maladaptation that sit around that. And I think, as I said, that there is an ongoing responsibility to keep pointing out these higher end risks. But what that says very strongly to me, and which has come through very strongly to me at this meeting too, is that uh, perhaps it's at that more local or regional in the sense of regions within Australia. Uh, it may well be that that, that sort of fo is our focus for the next couple of years, uh, because there's no question that at that sort of level, the city's level and so on, um, people simply have to get on and do things. They're, they're on the front line and no amount of wishing it out of existence uh, in North Carolina or anywhere else uh, is going to stop uh, that being the case. And then, of course, it becomes a real issue that they need to know adaptation options. They don't just want airy-fairy general ideas of, uh, of potential problems. Uh, they really need to know the options. I'm sorry, I can't seem to do a talk without putting this up briefly, but it just really emphasizes the importance of uh, thinking about the decisions that people are making now rather than uh, what's sort of vaguely going to happen in 2050, but thinking about those decisions um, and, then, and then asking whether they're going to run into issues in the future. And I think um, just another reflection from this meeting is it might be time for us to um, put to bed this framing of, uh, of vulnerability too, which is still very pervasive. Uh, the, uh, if you're really into adaptation planning rather than determining where the vulnerabilities might be, uh, then this, this framing which came out of earlier IPCC documents and before, uh, I think it, it, I've heard several times people comment that how difficult it is for councils and things like that to move beyond just getting more and more detail if you have this rather linear and, and um, uh, framing that ends up with apparently vulnerability as an end in its own right, um, how hard it is to get on from that to actually think about the adaptation decisions. This was uh, and, and remains very appropriate if you're trying to think about the motivation for mitigating because we need to know what the vulnerabilities and the impacts would be if we don't mitigate, but we seem to have decided not to, so it's probably time to stop worrying too much about that and get into a much more decision-centered thing. And I've heard a lot of that at this meeting, um, and it might be as well for us to make that a bit more uh, a rigorous sort of public statement that, the, that we need to focus much more in that sort of decision-centered thing, whether you use this sort of diagram from the UK Climate Impacts Program or, or many others. So last couple of points here, Chris. Um, 
So I think uh, one, of the, one of the important points that was made at the adaptation conference in Arizona, which I haven't commented on yet, but I'll pass two comments on now, uh, was that it was really important. Richard Klein made, a, made an appeal for much more rigor in our research. And I've heard a bit of that coming through here, which is great, because I think uh, that is a real challenge for us in all sorts of areas uh, to get away from woolly thinking on things like whether um, vulnerability itself actually helps you make adaptation decisions on exactly what sort of measures you have of those things and so on. So I've heard a lot more of that here. And the other thing, if I, if I, if I could say, which I think is a really important um, thing, is that I probably came away from Arizona. I had a great time there, and I probably drank too many margaritas there too. But, um, but I came away from the individual parallel sessions feeling that there was a bit of a splat of a lot of interesting bits of work, but not any great sort of real convergence amongst it. Whereas I've come from the meetings here uh, much more, uh, feeling much more empowered about the degree to which there's convergence in a whole lot of our sort of... Uh, uh, local planning sort of ideas, um, a, real, a real sense that there's a set of um, activities that have taken place across the continent and we're ready now to learn from the successes and failures and, and consolidate there. Uh, the same sort of thing in the business sessions, the same sort of thing uh, in the science policy discussion actually that someone mentioned a moment ago uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, in all sorts of areas there's I think a real opportunity for us um, to build on that convergence and, uh, and consolidate over the next few years. And I think, I think then if there is a slight sense that we need to focus down to this level for a year or two, then uh, the challenge for the next of these conferences in a couple of years is to have uh, seen a process of collation and, um, and consolidation uh, from this sort of level, which actually enables us then not only to deliver uh, consistent approaches and tools uh, for people who need to plan at this level, uh, but also to be able to shove back up to those other levels of governance the sorts of uh, issues that actually they've got to deal with because they are contextual and they are ones which uh, can't be handled at the local level. So thank you.